Well, very good morning to all of you. This is my first class with you. And introducing myself, Dr. Abhijit Kondo, Assistant Professor in Respiratory Medicine, James. And today the topic of discussion is the applied anatomy of the respiratory system. And it looks, uh, subject is very frightening, but I uh, try to uh, concentrate mostly on the applied portion and mostly on the lower respiratory tract. And actually we divide the respiratory system in the two portion. One is the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. That is arbitrary definition. And it extends from the nasal, uh, external nasal or uh, cavity or uh, external nares up to the larynx. This is the upper respiratory tract and below which up to the respiratory uh, system and up to the alveoli, it is the lower respiratory tract. Now, this is the organization and mainly consists of upper respiratory and lower respiratory tract. And now this is the, uh, you know, also the conducting portion of the uh, respiratory tract and particularly it involves nose, nasal cavity, pharynx and it up to the bronchioles. And respiratory portion that's involved in the small airways that's called the respiratory bronchioles and alveolar ducts as well as the alveoli. Now for today we mainly divide our discussion uh, concentrate on the thoracic cage, mediastinum, trachea and bronchial tree, lung and fluora and there is the basics of the chest x-ray that depends on the uh, our previous knowledge. Now this is a uh, thoracic cage and this is a, a, a bony costal uh, element and that is made as a box or cage like pattern and it mainly involves in the uh, organized in such a manner so it can protect our internal thoracic organs and also some abdominal visceras. So it is made of anteriorly by the manubrium, posteriorly by 12 thoracic vertebrae and intervertebral discs and laterally by the ribs and their costal cartilages and after which the first seven ribs are the true ribs and later five are the false ribs. And there are last two one, 11 and 12 are called the floating ribs. Now we already describe it. And this is the portion uh, which is uh, separated from the abdomen by the uh, diaphragm that is depicted by this line. Uh, there is a, a blue color line and there is a, also the thoracic inlet from the neck. Now after which we discuss mainly the normal anatomical portion but there is some anomaly that occurs and that we readily identify during the inspection of the thoracic system examination. So first one is the normal chest. The normal chest, this one is the normal chest and where on transverse section it is bilateral, symmetrical and elliptical and where the anteroposterior diameter is less than transverse diameter. This is the normal x-ray, normal uh, thoracic uh, cavity. Now there are some anomalies which are we have to readily identify. The first one is the kyphosis. Kyphosis is the uh, exaggeration of the normal anterior curvature. And it is mainly idiopathic, but there is some also seen in other causes. In India, it is most common in the tuberculosis and also the some vitamin D deficiency and osteomalacia. And when there is a, a exaggeration of curvature on the lateral side, it is called the scoliosis. And there is a both of joint, then it becomes a kyphoscoliosis. Now it becomes barrel separate chest and it is mostly common in COPD. And there is a hyperinflation where the AP diameter is more than transverse diameter and it is mostly seen in the hyperinflated lung field particularly COPD. Now come to the pectus excavitum and pectus excavitum where the lower portion of the turnum is depressed and associated with some costal elements. Usually it is a developmental anomaly and mostly asymptomatic and sometimes it has also been seen that the total sternum is moved posteriorly and in that time it may cause some cardiopulmonary symptoms. And another is the pectus carinatum or is it also called the pigeon chest where there is a uh, upper portion of the sternum with some costal elements may bulge forward and at the same time there is some depression in the lateral ridges or this is called the Harrison sulcus. And it is mainly seen in uh, uh, uncontrolled or poorly controlled asthma in childhood. And drooping of the shoulder, it is also sometimes observed in uh, inspection and it is mainly due to the pleuropulmonary fibrosis. Mm. 
this is the portion that's anatomical defect or the structural defect we have to identify during the regular uh, clinical examination. Now we move to the next second slide. This is the already we described. This is the normal finding is the symmetrical and elliptical in cross section. The anthroposterior diameter should be less than the lateral diameter. There are some abnormal finding like kyphosis, scoliosis and kyphoscoliosis. There is the exaggeration of the anterior curvature of the spine. Scoliosis is the exaggeration of the lateral curvature and kyphoscoliosis that involve both the deformities. Pectus cranitum already described as PGN chest. This is a localized prominence of the sternum and adjacent costal cartilages. There is a pectus excavatum funnel chest and barrel sepal chest, particularly when the associated with COPD or hyperinflation of the lung field. Now second one that comes after the thoracic cage, now we moves in, into the thoracic cavity. In the first one, this is a space that is not shared by the lung and the pleura. This is an open space. This is called the mediastinum. Okay. And it is bounded superiorly by the thoracic inlet, inferiorly by the diaphragm, informed by the manubrium sterni, and posteriorly by the uh, thoracic vertebrae and uh, thoracic spine, and laterally by the parietal pleura. Now, this is the mediastinum. We further divided for our discussion into two, two uh, sections. First one is the superior mediastinum and inferior mediastinum. Actually, there is a arbitrary horizontal line is joined between the T4 thoracic vertebrae and anteriorly by sternal angle. So, we divide the mediastinum into the superior mediastinum and also the inferior mediastinum. Inferior mediastinum is further divided on the presence of heart. It is the anterior, middle and posterior mediastinum. Now, we see the uh, picture. There is a horizontal line is there. This is the sternal angle and there is the thoracic spine. So, we join it and it forms a superior mediastinum and this is called the inferior mediastinum. Now come to the contents. The superior mediastinum is mainly vascular content. It causes, there is a superior vena cava, brachiocephalic vein, pulmonary trunk and arch of aorta. An inferior mediastinum, an inferior mediastinum or anterior mediastinum, it is also called the prevascular. There is also called the prevascular and main content is the thymus gland, lymph node and fat. And now come to the inferior mediastinum or the main bulk is, is the vascular mediastinum, we call it. And it contains heart, pericardium, phrenignum and main bronchi. And this is the inferior mediastinum and this is the uh, most posteriorly situated, this is the behind the heart and the main content in the uh, posterior mediastinum or this is called the post vascular mediastinum. Has the esophagus, thoracic duct, adagus vein, uh, vagus nerve and sympathetic trunk. Now why uh, this mediastinum is important? Because uh, during the clinical examination there are some symptoms that is sometimes not been explained by any lung pathology or on regular chest x-ray you find something new in the mediastinum or some SOL but the patient is still asymptomatic. So in this time we have to look the, any pathology in the mediastinum and the most common presenting symptom in the mediastinum is poorly localized pain and it is characterized by poorly localized diffuse and it is not sometimes associated with any other complaint like fever or uh, chest pain like that but it is very vague symptom is there. Okay. And uh, it is also uh, helpful because there are some uh, uh, anomaly, there is a childhood problems or childhood uh, anomaly that occur in the uh, mediastinum in the form of some cyst. It may be the vascular cyst, it may be tracheal cyst. Okay. These are also found in the mediastinum. Now come to the trachea. This trachea that starts from the lower end of the required cartilage and extend up to the uh, T4. There is a before division into the bronchi and it has two portion. One is the uh, extra thoracic and this one is the intra thoracic. And total length actually its total length is varies with respiration usually 10 to 12 centimeter and it consists of C sepid cartilage and these are absent in posteriorly and it is separated from the esophagus by only some membrane. This is we see on the right side there is some structure is there. This is the C-sepid cartilage that starts from here to there and this portion that is absent. And in the uh, and below the and this interthoracic portion that is the 6 to 9 centimeter long and at the level of T4 
or the sternal angle it divides into the two bronchi one is the right main bronchus and the left main bronchus now uh, the tachycardia exchange from the larynx we already explained and which fixes it down and bifurcates into the mediastinum at the level of the fifth thoracic vertebrae and its length is around 12 to 10 to 12 cm in adults and uh, intrathoracic tachycardia is 6 to 9 cm in length and it consists of 15 to 20 cisspid rings of hyaline cartilage now the applied portion is that whenever we uh, during the time of palpation what we palpate this is the extrathoracic portion of the tachycardia and there is a two signs are one signs are there this is called the trail sign that means whenever the mediastinal pathology is there or lung pathology the tachycardia is either shifted to the that side or shifted to the opposite side and for this reason whenever there is a ipsilateral shift of the tachycardia we found the sternal head of the uh, sternocleidomastoid that is become prominent and this is known as trail sign and there is also there is shifting of the tachycardia and we can divide into the two types either ipsilateral shift or contralateral shift and contralateral shift and ipsilateral shift particularly it occurs when there is pleuro pulmonary pathology and also the collapse of lung collapse of lung and pleuro pulmonary fibrosis and contralateral shift occurs particularly in case of pleural effusion pneumothorax and large mass in this situation and uh, it remains in the same when there is a no volume loss particularly in the consolidation the trachea remain in normal position so when there is change in the volume there is a uh, shift of the med uh, mediastinum and also shift of the upper portion of the trachea also by which then we can identify which of the pathology we are dealing with now comes to the bronchial tree now the intrathoracic trachea at the level of the t4 or sternal angle it becomes divided into the two bronchi one is the right main bronchi and the left main bronchi and the right main bronchi the main length is 1.5 to 2 cm while in the left it is up to 5 cm and the right bronchus is stout smaller and much more vertical than the left one and it this primary bronchi are further divided into the secondary bronchi or the lower bronchi and uh, this uh, lower bronchi is supplied on the right side there is a three lobes so there are three lower bronchi on the left side there are two lobes so there are two lower bronchi now this is see in the picture you see this this is the larynx and this is the lower portion of the trachea where it divides into the two portion one is the primary bronchi and it is divided on the right side this is called the right main bronchus and left one is the left main bronchus which is further divided into the secondary bronchi this one this one and this one these are three in number which are further divided into the tertiary bronchus to supply the particular portion of the lung that we call the bronchopulmonary segment and tertiary bronchi are further divided to form the bronchioles and from which there is respiratory bronchioles with a sinus it form the respiratory units now this is the uh, structure you can uh, see that there is a bronchopulmonary segment and also the uh, division of the bronchus this is the right main bronchus and there is a left main bronchus it is larger stout and more vertical so there is a foreign body sometimes when it is ingested it directly come into the right side of the lung okay and there is the secondary bronchi or the lower bronchi is there this is the three in number on the left side these are two and these are further divided to form the tertiary bronchi or this is called the segmental bronchi and the right side these are 10 in number 10 and on the left side it is 8 now come to the bronchial tree we have already described this portion ha uh, the right lung is supplied by the 10 tertiary bronchi and the left lung is supplied by the 8 to 10 tertiary bronchi and each tertiary bronchus is called the segmental bronchus because each portion of the lung supplied by the tertiary bronchus is called the bronchopulmonary segment now you can see that there is a some color difference on the left upper half this picture there is a primary bronchus there is a green in color up to this region then it becomes uh, Uh, involved in a enter into the lung substance in the right upper middle and lower lobe there are three secondary bronchi 
then it becomes further divided to form the tertiary bronchus and it becomes the smaller bronchi at the bronchioles. This is the devoid of cartilage and the size is less than 2 millimeter in size. This is the bronchial tree. Now come to the applied aspect of the bronchopulmonary segment and particularly we are very much important for some diseases and there are some opacities when occur in the uh, sea in the uh, lung x-ray and uh, that involves in a particularly bronchopulmonary segment. We have to presume that there is some etiology will be there. Whenever there is opacity in the epicoposterior region, in the both the apical region, in the both either left or right upper lobe, so we can think it may be due to the possibility is the infection due to the tuberculosis. When it involves the anterior segment, there is a possibility of malignancy. And when the supine position, if there is any aspiration, that occurs in the epicoposterior region. And there is also particularly in the malignancy or lung carcinoma, when it is involved in a particular segment. So, there is a some segmentectomy or lobectomy is done. So, the bronchopulmonary segment can be useful for uh, this also. Now, come to the gross anatomy of the lung. So, the each lung you know already about it, then the right and left, the both lungs are there and the right side there is a three lobe, one is the upper, middle and lower lobe and initially it is divided by oblique fissure into the primarily upper and lower lobe and there is a high lung, there is another a demarcation or line is uh, made from the hilum to the oblique fissure and that separate the upper lobe to the middle lobe. So, there is a right, there is a three lobe, upper, middle, lower and the left side this oblique fissure divides into the on mainly upper and lower lobe. And uh, it is uh, relatively blunt superior range, this is called the apex and also the lung boundary mostly it rests on the muscular diaphragm and anterior, middle and posteriorly it is uh, bounded by the thoracic ribs or the rib cage and on the medial side it is separated from the other lung by mediastinum. So, you can see it there is a upper lobe, this one is the middle lobe and there is a lower lobe. So, this is the oblique fissure there is already been shown and there is the horizontal fissure and the left side there is a oblique fissure that divides into the mainly in the upper lobe and lower lobe. And this is the medial aspect particularly it is shown mainly the hilum and hilar structure. And this portion is the very important because this portion is only the lateral view of the each lung and where there is a some uh, clear demarcation and color demarcation is there that is the which portion of the lung is supplied by the which bronchopulmonary segment. And this apical portion that we already discussed this is the apicoposterior region and this is the main site of tuberculosis. Any lesion there, there is a suggestive, any lesion in the anterior segment is become some malignant one. And in case of the superior segment of the lower lobe, there is also be a very side of tuberculosis infection. And on the left side, there is the same thing is occurred, but here the one thing is the, uh, there is no other uh, separate posterior segment. We can see that epicoposterior segment and there is some lingular segment is there, superior lingual and inferior lingular. Now, we come to the pleura and pleural cavities. Actually, pleura this is an outline that covers uh, both the lung and it is divided into the uh, visceral pleura and the parietal pleura. Visceral pleura that tightly attached with the lung and the parietal pleura that covers the uh, mainly the th inner portion of the thorax and it is divided uh, in, uh, into many portion. One is the costal pleura, mediastinal pleura and the diaphragmatic pleura the depending on the situation and it is formed by simple squamous epithelium. That portion you already described. This is the outline. Now, you see that this blue line that is the visceral pleura and the red line that is the parietal pleura. Whenever it is situated on the thoracic case that is called the costal pleura. This portion is situated over diaphragm. So, this is called the diaphragmatic pleura and this is the mediastinum that is called the mediastinal pleura. And actually this pleural cavity is not free, there is some serous fluid is there and it acts as a lubricant and it prevents during the uh, time of an injury and it also uh, prevents the friction during inspiration and expiration. So, that the visceral and parietal pleura glide over each other. 
So this is the small portion of the recapitulation of the your uh, anatomy portion, and I think this anatomy portion is very much important. This basic anatomy portion is needed just for uh, for regular daily uh, clinical practices and just to underlying of your uh, pathology and your disease process, the which lung is involved, mediastinal involvement, and also there is interpretation of the chest X-ray. So our next topic we will discuss on the some basics of the chest X-ray depending on the knowledge we uh, gathered till now. Now we are uh, discussing some basics of chest X-ray and before uh, before starting to the uh, chest X-ray we have to know particularly the radiographic densities. Whenever just defect one thing, this is the like this is human body and this is the source of X-ray. Source of X-ray this is cassette and just like human body. So whenever X-ray beam passes through the human body, some of the X-ray beam is absorbed through the human body and there is a different texture or different organs are there and that uh, absorb the X-ray beam in a different way or some absorb it is more than the denser one and then it is reflected to the cassette where the images is produced. So whenever this uh, X-ray beam passes through the dense structure, so more of the X-ray is absorbed and the picture which we obtain is a more radio opaque and lesser dense structure, the less X-ray beam absorbed and more reflected towards the cassette or there is a uh, acceptor and so there is much more translucent or radiolucent. So whenever uh, it becomes uh, any bone or it is calcium or any instrument or metals, it produces opaque structure because most of the uh, X-ray beam is absorbed in this uh, materials. And next one is the fat, here the density is uh, more than air, still it produces some black shadow or lucent shadow, black or either grey. Tissue produces grey shadow and air is black. Now you can see on the right side, uh, this is the normal chest X-ray, now you see the bone, it is the opaque, most opaque because most of the X-ray portion or X-ray beam is absorbed and heart, heart is considered at the diaphragm, these are considered to be the soft tissue. So most of them uh, produce the grey structure or grey in colour and air, it is mostly the uh, lung is consists of full of air. So air, uh, through the air, the most of the uh, X-ray beam passes through it and produces the translucent densities. So whenever we interpreting uh, the densities, so we have to know about the white structure, that means it is bone or metal, either it may be bone, metal or calcium. Whenever it is black, that means there is air, uh, it may be either uh, in the lung or it may be the intestine or other structure in between them, there is the grey colour that is produced mainly by the tissues, tissues and fat. And during the uh, time of interpretation of the X-ray, there is the following uh, details we have to know. First one is the uh, patient detail, this is the view, exposure, rotation and breathe. The pneumonia kicks P valve. What, what are the patient details? We also know about the uh, patient name, patient age, then uh, date of the uh, X-ray and we have to corroborate with the uh, actual name of the patient in the ticket, whether we are dealing with the same patient X-ray or other patient. And there is also been male and female sometimes detained but sometimes not. We have to identify the presence of breast shadows. Now come to the views. The, there are major four views are there. One is the PA view, AP lateral and the lateral decubitus view. Now come to the PA view. This is a more, uh, commonly we do the PA view. And here there is a X-ray beam projected from the posterior side, the source is posterior. There is the X-ray beam and there is the cassette. An X-ray beam is produced and this uh, projected on the back of the patient and anteriorly there is cassette or the receptor uh, is there and it will take the view. This is the standard uh, chest X-ray view and taken in the full inspiration. And we will discuss why we take the full inspiratory view and this is the uh, normal X-ray, this is the PA view. And there is the AP view, that means the X-ray is projected from the front of the patient and the cassette is placed on the behind or back. Or sometimes if the patient is too ill, we have to do the X-ray, there is a projected from the sources on the above the patient. 
when the patient is uh, is too weak or in the ICU, the patient cannot move, so we took the supine X-ray. So there is some AP view and the supine view. These are further. Uh, there are some criteria that will differentiate between the AP view and the PA view. Now on the left side, this is the PA. On the right side, there is the AP view. First one, we see the clavicle. When uh, in the PA view, just see the PA view that is over the lung field. This is the clavicle. This is the good amount. This portion is present on the uh, lung view, but on the AP view, that is mostly outside the lung field. This is the first one. Second one is the uh, presence of scapula. Actually, the scapula is away from the lung field. Just you see that this is the scapular border is going on here, and here the scapula is this portion. This is the over the lung field, and the ribs. Ribs mostly the posterior ribs are distinct in case of AP view. Or is the anterior ribs are distinct? Uh, uh, anterior ribs are distinct in uh, AP view, and posterior ribs are distinct in PA view. And heart, there is an apparent cardiomegaly there. In case of AP view. Now come to the lateral view. Particularly, the lateral view is important to see that any retrocardiac portion or any pathology in the retrocardiac portion or in the any uh, pathology in the posterior mediastinum. And from here, we can divide the lung into the by oblique fissure that is the upper lobe just see on the and this is the lower lobe and this is very much important just to know the lower pathology any mediastinal mass any encysted pleural fluid or basal consolidation just like if any consolidation is there whenever we take took any uh, pa view actually the diaphragm obliterate or diaphragm overshadow this pathology so we can't see in uh, normal pa view so we have to do the lateral view now come to the lateral decubitus view this is the we usually do in a special situation when we consider any small amount of the pneumothorax or any small amount of the pleural effusion then we do the lateral decubitus in the pleural effusion it becomes opaque on the hemithorax or it comes in the upward position and the pneumothorax as is here it also come into the upper portion now you see that the beam is projected from the lateral side now assessment of the exposure before assessment of the exposure we have to know what is the normal this one is the normal x-ray and we just visible the vertebrae behind the heart and this is the normal x-ray but whenever we uh, whenever it is uh, taking in any other form or the x-ray beam passed very less amount it produces total white opaque picture and that is called the over calling now you you can't see or you can't differentiate the thoracic vertebrae from the heart structure that is the under exposure or over calling and right hand side this is the over exposure that becomes lung or if you see that it is more translucent now on a high quality radiograph the vertebral body should be just visible through the heart but whenever there is a insufficient amount of x ray photons are passed it becomes much more whiter so we call it over calling pathology and similarly the opposite thing when the number of x ray beam are less so we get the more blackened or more radio lucent picture that is called the under calling now come to the assessment of the patient rotation for rotation we have to just concentrate on the distance between the two sternal head of clavicle and these are equidistant from the spinous process present in between them so whenever uh, there is a rotation uh, that portion becomes much more distant than the opposite side now see on the uh, this x ray just to see this is the spinous process and this is the sternal head the distance is less but this distance is more and the lung is more translucent and in this uh, in this x ray this left lung is rotated towards the x ray beam and that's why it becomes much more radio lucent now what will you see on the uh, high quality chest x ray on the medial end of the both the clavicles should be the equidistant from the spinous process of the vertebral body projected between the clavicles and uh, so whenever there is rotation to the side which the patient is rotated looks more translucent now comes to the inspiratory effort an inspiratory effort on the uh, pa view uh, we see the uh, anterior uh, ribs and this is count on the 
first six ribs can be visible on the anteriorly and the tenth rib this is the posteriorly this is the normal view now see one this is two this is three third this is fourth this is fifth and this is sixth and posteriorly just like we count up to the tenth rib and this is the normal whenever there is a more than six rib is visible that is called the hyperinflation now come to the interpretation of the these are the basics and now comes to the interpretation now interpretation of the chest x-ray we see the airway just uh, uh, memorize like a b c d e f g in a approach and if you see it regularly so you will make a habit of it so airway bone and tissues then cardiac shadows diaphragm d effusion fields gastric bubbles hyla or the mediastinum now this is a normal uh, chest x-ray still now which we have already described regarding the anatomy of the lung this is the gross anatomy and this has been uh, uh, portrayed here this is the normal chest ray and every portion of the uh, mediastinum including the heart and also the lung those are uh, depicted and particularly the hilum and this portion is very important and now you, how will you uh, uh, differentiate the site hmm. sometimes it is not written either l for left or r for right this is the mnemonic this is internationally accepted still if it is not there we have to identify the which is the left side and which is the right side of the patient and we can see it x-ray now here it is marked l that means in the left side this this area is the left hemithorax if it is absent we have to know the cardiac apex the heart is shifted to the left and there is the uh, gastric bubble more that if there is any anomaly or any dextrocardia so they are maybe the heart shifted to the right side and sometimes the gastric bubble you can see on the right side now come to the lateral view lateral view we uh, already described because just to know the lower pathology uh, your mediastinum and also to see the hilum we can uh, just uh, do the lateral view and there is some two translucent area is there the first one and the second one the first one is called this is the tachea and the second portion is called the esophagus now come to the lung zones actually these lung zones are very arbitrarily divided just for description purpose when there is any plural pathology is involved we divide into the upper zone mid zone and the lower zone upper zone that means this portion up to the second rib and from second to fourth rib this is the mid zone and below the mid zone is the lower zone up to the diaphragm so it doesn't has any uh, corresponding uh, lobe is there but for plural pathology we use it now assessment of the hyla region actually this hyla is from this portion this is the concave portion in the chest x-ray it is uh, formed by the lower lobe pulmonary artery and the superior pulmonary vein and usually uh, left upper uh, uh, on the left hilum that is 1 to 1.5 cm higher than the right one and the normal shape it is concave whenever you see any uh, chest x-ray pf you see any there is a obliteration of the concavity either in the form of uh, any opacity and this opacity uh, may be abnormal and it is considered abnormal and just to look at the opacity whether it is lobulated or rounded opacity the lobulated just like it there is a rounded opacity and this is the lobulated opacity and lobulated opacity that means some lymphoma and this rounded opacity it may be any malignancy it may be cystic structure or it may be any neural cyst tumor or it may be a lymph node also so both the hyla should be concave and this result from the superior pulmonary vein uh, and crossing the lower lobe pulmonary artery and usually the left hilum is superior to the right by 1 cm now you can see or you can identify the normally it is concave now come to the diaphragm this diaphragm this portion is very much important particularly in case of effusion there is a costophrenic and the cardiophrenic angles are there these are obliterated but costophrenic angle and the diaphragm is particularly important in case of subpulmonic effusion now you see that there are two lines are there one is the a and b line so whenever we join it through the uh, cardiac and costophrenic angle and there is a and another line is joined uh, or just drawn with the apex of the or highest point of the diaphragm there is a distance is there that is around 1.5 cm whenever there is any subpulmonic collection this uh, highest point is shifted more laterally just to see on the left side also and uh, this is the diaphragmatic outline on the c this is the right and this is the left and usually the right diaphragm is uh, elevated normally than left diaphragm and there are two angles are created one is the uh, costophrenic angle and one is the cardiophrenic angle and this costophrenic angle are obliterated when this are obliterated so there is will be some collection it may be fluid it may be blood 
or uh, it may be some pass will be there and there is a costophonic angle and this is an obtuse angle and it is sometime this portion is broadened because of any portion like a, if any there is any cyst or any uh, other structure or there so there is increase in the cardiophonic angle. And the last one whenever we see everything is uh, over now we see the bones and soft tissues of the uh, chest x-ray particularly it is very much important when patient present with some chest pain and we have to look for any bony erosion or any trauma so just to look out any bony erosion or any refracture and also after uh, post-operative patient uh, if the patient came we have to look for any punched out lesion is there or not just to rule out any metastasis and it is very much important whenever there is absence of breast or any mastectomy is there we should uh, look for any mass or any uh, punched out lesion or any fracture in the ribs. Now this is the hidden area and this hidden area is very much important for interpretation. Sometimes clinically you found that there is some uh, obliteration uh, or there is absent brain sound posteriorly but the chest x-ray remain normal or there is uh, something uh, patient complaining of in the mediastinal or central chest pain but still x-ray seems to be normal. So we have to look for some of the hidden areas particularly in the apical areas uh, this area uh, mostly bounded by some deep shadows and clavicle shadows are there so there is a some structure may be present behind it. So it sometimes missed and also the high large structure that we already described if there is loss of concavity that means there is something is there. It may be lymphoma, it may be mass, it may be neural tumor and there is a good amount of lung is there in the behind the heart there is a retrocardiac portion. So we have to do whenever you suspect anything so you have to do the lateral x-ray. And this portion is also be bounded or by the diaphragm there is a significant amount of the lung is there just behind the diaphragmatic cupola. Okay. So whenever we just interpret it if the patient has symptom and on clinical examination you have uh, some signs but still the x-ray seems to be normal then you have to do either lateral x-ray or the decubitus x-ray just to find out the pathology.